And let me start with the question that we left last lecture. So uh, last lecture, we investigated the Kurno Duopoly. We found the Nash solutions, the Nash equilibria, using two methods, directly using the profit function and also using indifference curves. Uh, so the Nash equilibria we found for the Cournot's duopoly was when both agents produced alpha minus C over uh, three, when both firms produced, uh, we gave the definition of the Nash equilibrium. So the place where we left off was, what is the, well, the first question we asked was, is there a relation between Nash solutions and Pareto efficient strategy profiles? And the answer was no. But maybe for this specific case, the Nash solution might be Pareto efficient. So that's where we left. Some of your friends claimed that it was. Uh, was there anybody who said it wasn't? I don't remember. That's where the class ended. So, what is your guess? But it's efficient. Anybody else? So, Nash equilibria are but it uh, efficient. Well, now in, in in general, we don't know. It's, we know that it's not the case. So, is this Nash equilibria of the Cournot duopoly but it efficient or not? So how many watt for Pareto efficient? One. How many watt for not Pareto efficient? One. Last lecture, two, three, four, five. So the number has increased for uh, not. Okay. So actually, last lecture, when some of you claimed that it was Pareto efficient, the idea was, if it was not, you know, it's uh, well. Let me let me draw the picture. So let's have our picture, Q1, Q2, we have the alpha minus C, alpha minus C over 2. This was the graphic representation of the best response correspondence of firm 1. and. And this was the graphic representation of the best response correspondence of firm uh, two. And this was our Nash solution. Okay. So the idea some of you had was, well, if it wasn't Pareto efficient, by moving, by player one changing his strategy, he would have to do, there, he would have to do better. Okay, but that contradicted with this point being a Nash equilibria, because you know if it was not Pareto efficient, then there would be something Pareto dominating. Well, if there is something Pareto dominating, by moving in that direction, the payoff of firm one would increase. Okay, or vice versa, move along the vertical line, the payoff of firm two will increase. Okay, well, we know that that's not the case. But again, you see, when you're looking for Pareto domination, a point, you know, so whether a point, when you're comparing for Pareto domination, you don't only look for points on these lines, you look for points on the whole space. Okay. So that's one problem. Uh, moreover, when you, you know, if when we move from year to year, player one's payoff increases, we also have to make sure that player two does not become worse off. So it's not only one player that we check. We have to check. We have to make sure that nobody becomes worse off. At least one person becomes. At least one agent becomes better off. Okay. So what would you do? 
to get to a conclusion. Buy your profit. So how would you find that point? So your friend says, find the profits at, you know, profits is numeric representation. Find the profits of the, each firm at the Nash solution. And find uh, another strategy profile, a point on the space, which gives each agent at least that profit level and at least one of them a higher profit level. Okay. Is there anything that we can do graphically? So let's draw the eyes of profits, okay? So take this point. That's actually, let me draw this picture a little bigger. Once more. Actually, why don't you do it on your paper? Okay. I want a larger picture. That's. B1. That's B2. And that is our Nash solution. Okay. So because this is a Nash solution, okay, so Q2 star. Q1 star, okay. Q1 star is the best response to the strategy Q2 star of player two, right? So what does that say about the indifference curve passing through this point? The isoprofit curve passing through this point. We actually drew it, right? It was something like a you know, shifted parabola, the addition of a line and a hyperbola, okay? So if you remember, the Isaac curve looks something like this, right? Okay. So that's a Isaac curve for pro, uh, for agent one. Now let's do the same thing for agent two, because Q two star is the best response of uh, of player two to Q one star. Uh, what does the indifference curve of player two have to look like? Well, the same, just flipped around the 45 degree line. So it's going to be something like this. And let me draw the arrows to show the direction of increasing preferences, the direction of the preferred alternatives. So given this, what can you say about the Pareto efficiency of this point? Just by looking at this picture. Yep. I guess the, the, uh, the intersection part, uh, the part of the That is. The part that from your gestures, I guess this is the region that you're talking about, right? Any point in this region, okay, included in the boundary except this point, Pareto dominates the Nash solutions, right? So when I compare, let's take a point here. Let's call this Q prime. So from this picture, I can easily see that pi one of Q prime is bigger than pi one of Q star, the Nash solution. Why? Because it's Inside, it's in the direction pointed okay, by this arrow on this indifference curve. So it's, I'm going to call it, it's in the inside of the indifference curve passing through the Nash solution. Okay. Any point in this region is preferred by agent one, firm one, to any point on this line. So that's what we have. And the same thing is true for? Layer two, which means that Q prime, but it dominates Q star, which means that the Nash solution is 
not Pareto efficient. Okay, so far so good? So all these points, not only one, quite a bit of those points, does Pareto dominate the Nash solution? Okay, okay. any questions? Any questions? So what if we wanted to find the set of all Pareto efficient strategy profiles? What would you do? By the way, keep this picture in mind. I'm going to come back to this. Could you please sign pass around? How would you find the set of protection strategy profiles? So, for example, if I take this point, is this strategy profile product efficient? Is this strategy profile part of the efficient? How do you know? How do you decide whether it's part of the efficient or not? Sorry? So where did you find it? What dominates it? How did you find it? How do you decide whether this point is part of the efficient or not? Sorry? For example, which ones? For example, the Nash, right? So the thing is, how do you decide that this point is better? Well, one thing, you know, this indifference curve gives an idea. But the best way to do it is, well, given a point, OK, the best thing to do is draw the indifference curves, in this case, either profits of both firms through this point. We already have the indifference curve of player uh, one. So all I'll do is draw the indifference curve of player two, which is going to be something like this. Okay. So once you have that, what we see is any point in this region, put at the dominates this point. Okay. Okay. So this point is now put at the efficient. What about this point. How do you decide? Yep. Well, I think the process of the set is the set of when Q1 is 0 or Q2 is 0, and the um, point where the iso profits curves are attached to each other. The iso, well, well, wait a minute. So Q1 is equal to 0? Any point? On this point region? Yeah, any point on the axis. So your friends, this picture is getting messy, but let's continue. So your friends claim is that any point on this, no? Change our mind. OK. But the second part, we'll get to it after I take your friend's comment. Yep. Exactly right. So you see, when the sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's let's check that first. That's B1. Again, I'll draw B2. So you claim that this point is Pareto efficient? Is this point Pareto efficient? Okay, so not any point on this region is 
but it's efficient, right? So only. Okay. So which one is that? We'll look into it. Let's. Well, let's let's start with this. So, player ones. Fermi one's indifference curve through this point, if you remember, was something like this. Right? That's what player one's indifference curve looked like. What did player two's indifference curve through this point look like? Exactly, your friend had the guest chair. It looked like something like this. Right? So can this point be Pareto efficient? No. no, right? All these points, Pareto dominate this point. So this cannot be. So this point, Pareto dominates this point. The only place where this doesn't happen is at this point. Okay? So this point is Pareto efficient. Okay? Similar arguments shows that this point is Pareto efficient. What about in between? Well, as your friends suggested, okay, so that's an indifference curve for firm uh, two. And if I draw an indifference curve, well, I have to have tangency here, so let me, well, how do I want this? Picture was now. So the indifference curve is something like this. Okay, that's the indifference curve of firm one. The blue is the indifference curve for firm one. The red is the indifference curve for firm two. Now let's look at this point. To make agent one as good as he is at this point, we have to choose a strategy profile in this region. Okay. So if I want to move to another strategy profile, which agent one is as good as he was here, it has to be a point in this region. By the same argument, okay, Pareto domination, there should exist another strategy profile which no agent is worse off. So I don't want to make agent two wor worse off. So the only strategy profiles where agent two is not worse off are strategy profiles in this region. Which means that if agent one is not worse off, agent two becomes worse off. If agent two is not worse off, agent one becomes worse off. So this point is Pareto efficient. And as your friend suggested, it's the point where the indifference curves are tangent to each other. Okay? Of course, tangency alone is not enough. Uh, because you see, I could have the indifference curve of firm one could be like this, increasing uh, direction in this direction. Okay. Uh, okay. The indifference curve of firm two could be like this, increasing direction. This. Okay. In this case, can this? They're tangent. Indifference curves are tangent, but is this point Pareto efficient? No, right? All these points parted to dominate this point. If I move from here to here, we make both player one and player two better off. Okay? So quasi-concavity of, uh, of the numeric representation, that is the upper contour sets being convex, together with the tangency, okay, makes the point a parted efficient point. Okay? So far, so good? Okay. Yes, sir. All these points in this region, except this point, okay, because when I move from here to here, nobody is worse off, but for Pareto domination, we need at least one individual becoming better off. So all these points, Pareto dominate this point. Which one this? Okay. Uh, 
or these points. Well, again, so how do I decide whether, so your friend's question is, is points in this, these points, Pareto dominate the Nash solution. Are all these points Pareto efficient? Well, the way to decide is take a point, draw the indifference curves. And once you draw the indifference curves, unless they are tangent, they will not be Pareto efficient. Okay? And of course, not all the points would be points of tangency of indifference curves. Okay? So far, so good? Okay. So how do you find those points? How do you find the set of all Pareto efficient strategy profiles? How do you write the condition of tangency? Sorry? The upper contour set should be, have only one intersection, but that's not a very mathematically useful method. It's a useful method when you're working with pictures, but at the end of the day, when I say calculate the set of all Pareto efficient strategy profiles, it's not a very efficient way. Okay, so how would you use it? What, what do you mean by derivatives of curves? Curves don't have derivatives. They have uh, functions have derivatives. The derivative of what? Okay. What do you mean by with respect to the agent? There's two agents. There's strategies. What, what do you mean by Lagrange solution? Lagrange we use for maxim, solving maximization, minimization problems. You guys have the idea. The ideas are right, but it's not exactly. The gradient is a very useful tool in this case. Exactly. Okay. So. If these two, so actually, let's say that it was like this, okay? If the indifference curves are smooth, the gradients will be well-defined. And what do we know about the gradients? The gradients are always perpendicular to the tangent plane at the point, okay? So here I have the tangent plane. So if both of them are tangent to the same plane, okay, this would be the gradient of, this is firm two, pi two evaluated at the point Q, that's the point Q. This would be the gradient of the profit function of firm one, evaluated at Q, okay? So actually, tangency means that these two indifference curves being tangent to each other means that the gradients should be pointing in opposite directions, okay? So in this case, of course, this except boundary points, Q is if there exists a positive K, such that the gradient of pi 1 at q is equal to k times the gradient of pi 2 at k, then q is Pareto efficient. Okay. Again, this works because we know that the upper contour sets are convex. Okay. So all you do is write the gradients, look for which points can you find such a k? All those points would be Pareto efficient. Would you like me to try to find them or would you do it yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I took k positive. Yes, opposite direction. So I should take k negative or minus k. Thank you. Yeah. They should be, as the picture suggests, they should be in opposite directions, or k negative. Okay, they're not equal because they might have different sizes. That's why we need the k. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, what other method can we use to find product deficient points? Actually, we did talk about one method.
you remember, which we used to make some statement about the existence of Pareto efficient strategy profiles. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's why I said, uh, so this condition works when the upper contra sets. By the way, I assume that because everybody knows about upper contra sets. Would you like me to define? OK, well, let, let me give. So we usually use it. You should have seen it in econ theory. Uh, so. of a preference relation Ri, or its numeric representation Ui. So we denote it with, well, at least in this course, we will denote it with Uc upper counter set of the relation Ui at the point Q, OK? At the, well, let me give you the general definition. At the strategy profile, S. That's the set of all strategy profiles, S, such that Ui of S prime, it's the set of all strategy profiles, S prime, such that Ui of S prime is greater or equal to Ui of S. So it's the set of all strategy profiles, which are at least as good as S for an agent with a preference relation represented by Ui. OK? So, if the gradient points in this direction, this set is the upper counter set of player two at the point Q. OK? So if I say that the upper counter set should be convex, so we have a convex set. That's the upper counter set for player two. That's the upper counter set for player one. Okay. OK. These are two convex set. So saying that they have no intersection other than this point, that was the condition for Pareto efficiency. OK. But of course, if the upper counter sets was not convex, this would not work. We could have had something, an indifference curve going like this for player one, an indifference curve going like this for player two, and this point would Pareto dominate this point. OK, so this works when the upper counter sets of the preference relations of each agent is convex. That is, the numeric that is, each agent has a numeric representation, which is quasi-concave. OK, so far so good? Okay, well, let's go back to my second question. Uh, what other method can you use to find Pareto efficient strategy profiles? Which, sorry? Exactly, maximize. So remember, we had a theorem when we first introduced, when we first started studying uh, Pareto efficiency, we had a theorem which said if a strategy profile maximizes the sum of the numeric representations, in this case, the profit functions, it will be Pareto efficient. So one thing you can look at is solve the following problem. Maximize u1 of q plus u2 of q, subject to, well, in this case, pi1, pi2, subject to Q and S, which was R square plus. But yes, your friend has a point there. OK, well, we don't know. It, you know. This maximization problem could have only one solution. It could have infinitely many. Maybe it doesn't have any. OK? Maybe it doesn't have any solution. OK? And even 
If it has solutions, one or many, yep. Uh, well, initially when I look at it, I can't guarantee that. Even though the functions are continuous, the domain is not compact. So we're not guaranteed the existence, but using other extra two. So I know that this problem has a solution, okay? But how do I know it? Well, there are several ways that we can go, but you see, we're trying to maximize the sum over all this region. What I can do is, outside this region, the profit of both firms are negative, okay? So if this problem has a solution, it has to be within this region, okay? So rather than looking for a maximum in this region, I can look at a maximum in this region, okay? But this is a compact set. This is a continuous function. So this maximization problem has a solution. And it will be positive because at least when I put Q equal to zero, zero, the profits are zero. So this problem has a maximization. Uh, this maximization problem does have a solution because I can reduce the problem with a compact domain continuous function, okay? But the thing is, this doesn't say, this says if, our theorem says, if Q solves this maximization problem, it is Pareto deficient. It doesn't say any Pareto deficient point can be found as a solution of this maximization problem, okay? Which actually, in this case, it does. <coughs> but in general, it's not guaranteed, okay? I'll leave it as an exercise to you. So it's a simple calculus problem, okay? Solve this problem. See with what do you get. And solve this problem and see what you get. I'll tell you what the answer is. It's going to be all the points on this line. When C1 is equal to C2 is equal to C. When both firms have the same constant marginal cost, the set of Pareto deficient allocations would be the points on the slide. Okay? Okay? Any questions? Any questions? None? Okay. Uh, well, while we have this, let's let's take a look at this. Why doesn't these two firms get together, form a cartel, okay, and choose a Q which maximizes their profit and split the profit equally? What would happen if that if they did that? Sorry? Uh, what do you think they would produce? They would produce uh, the total one over alpha over two. The total product would be? Alpha. So. <coughs> equal to? Would be? So, any strategy profile Q where the sum is equal to alpha minus C over two would maximize the sum of the profits, okay? So, for example, alpha minus C over four, alpha minus C over four, 
would maximize the profit. So rather than these firms trying to maximize, do their own business, go on after maximizing their own profit, why don't they just form a cartel? Okay. Form a cartel and maximize the sum of the act in a way to maximize the sum of their profits, not their individual profits. They will get this. Which Pareto dominates? The Nash solution. Why don't they do that? Why don't they do that? Why don't they do that? Let's get it from somebody. Exactly, right? So if so this is the point that we're talking about. If player one knows that player two is going to produce alpha minus C over four, that's what they agreed on, shook hands, but could not make any binding agreements. The competition authority doesn't allow for it. Moreover, if they made a binding agreement, it would not be the Cournot duopoly that they would be paying, it would be, that they would be playing. They would be playing a different game. Okay? So let's keep things simple. The competition authority does not allow them to make binding agreements. Okay? In that case, even if we shook hands, if I think that you're going to produce alpha minus c over 2, my best response is not to produce alpha minus c over 2, but it's to produce something higher. Okay? So I would not stick with this agreement because there's nothing you can do to me. That's a one-shot game. We're going to play it tomorrow, and it's going to be over. If the game was repeated, things could change. If we could make binding agreements, things could change. But this is a very simple model, which is a one shot, one played once, and goes. Okay? So we'll look into cases what would happen if this game is repeated. Then things might change. Okay? Because you might say, hey, wait a minute, you had promised this, but did not play it. And you might try to punish me. Okay? We'll look into those games. Okay? That's, but because this is a, not an Ash solution, at least one agent has an incentive to deviate from it. Actually, both agents has an incentive to deviate in this case. That's why the cartel solution is not sustainable, because it's not a Nash solution. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. What would happen? So I think we more or less understood what happens in a duopoly. What would happen if we had a Oligopoly, that is n firms rather than two firms. Let me write the profit function of uh, individual firm. That was equal to uh, QI times maximum of 0 and alpha minus summation qj, j in n, minus c times qi. We solved this problem when we had alpha minus q2 here. And when we solved it, what we found was the best response of player i to well, let me start with player 1 to Q2 was alpha minus Q2 divided by two, uh, alpha minus Q2 divided by 2 if Q1 plus Q2 was less than or equal to alpha, it was 0 otherwise. I can think of this as Q1 plus semi Q, 
I plus QJ, where J is different than I. So, what would happen if I had QI here? I'm looking at the best response of agent I to a strategy profile Q minus I in a cornosal gopoline. Exactly, look at the analogy, right? Look at the analogy, it's the same thing. The only thing is, rather than Q2, what we have is summation Q minus I. Uh, I'm sorry, QJ, let's write bigger. Alpha minus summation Q. J, J different than I over 2. If that's the case, well, if what is the case? Summation Q, J, J over N is less than or equal to alpha. Okay. So that would be the best response. It easily expands from here to here. Nothing fancy. You don't have to resolve the maximization problem with N variables. And then if we do this, if we do this, I'm not going to solve it, it's just simple algebra. What you find is the Nash solutions of the Cournot oligopoly is a single strategy profile Q star where for any i in N. Q I star is equal to alpha minus C over N plus 1. I'll leave it as an exercise to you again. It's simple algebra. But the idea is the same way we did it for two player. Okay? And when you let N equals to 2, you get the solution for the duopoly, which we already did, alpha minus C over 3. Okay? When n is equal to 1, what do you get? It's actually the monopoly, monopolistic solution. Okay? When, okay? Any questions? Any questions? Done? Okay. Uh, let's see. Should we look at... What would you ask yourself at this stage? So we already asked several questions. Parrot efficiency, we answered. You can easily show that this is not parrot efficient. Again. What can you say? What else? What other interesting questions can you ask? So when n is equal to 1, we get alpha minus c over 2, which is the monopoly solution. By the way, how do we find the monopoly solution in introduction to economics? We had uh, q. Quantity, oh, yes, 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 yes. That was our demand function. So, in 101, Introduction to Microeconomics, how did you find the, the monopoly solution? So how do you find what's the marginal revenue when? The revenue function, we take derivative of the revenue function, but if the demand is linear, the marginal revenue will also be linear, if you remember from 101, 
It's been a long time for most of you. And it will have a slope which is twice the demand function. So marginal revenue would be something like this. That's marginal revenue. That's demand. And how do you find the optimal point? Well, you have to draw the marginal cost. Here, the marginal cost is constant and is equal to C. Okay. So the quantity produced would be this point. The price charged would be this. That's the monopoly. Q monopoly, P monopoly. Okay. So far, so good. That's 101. I'm just going fast over it. Okay. So when we studied monopoly, what was one of the interesting things we asked? We asked what the consumer surplus was, right? So that's the consumer's surplus. Okay. So that's alpha minus C over 2. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Today I don't know what I have. It's, okay, that's the price, so that's the consumer surplus. Sorry about that. Okay. So when you have a duopoly, what happens? The total amount produced becomes each firm produces alpha minus C over 3. So the total amount is 2 alpha. So the total amount produced is going to be, I don't know where it lies, but alpha 2 alpha minus C over 3. And the consumer surplus would increase. And as the number of firms increases, what happens? The total amount produced would be, each firm produces this much. So the total amount produced would be n times alpha minus c over n plus 1, okay? which converges to what? As the number of firms increases, alpha minus c, which is this point. Okay? So as the number of firms keeps increasing, the total quantity produced would converge to alpha minus c, and the price, market price, will converge to the marginal cost c, which is what you get in a perfectly competitive market. Okay? So the Kurnodop oligopoly model actually covers the case from the monopoly, when n is equal to 1, to a perfectly competitive market, where n goes to infinity. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Well, let's take a break here. <laughs>